Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to look at a macroeconomic concept, and that is supply-side interventionist policies. And as an applied example, and I've used this many times, I uh, like using um, Singapore as an example of the effectiveness of supply-side interventionist policies. Um, here we're measuring gross national income per capita over time. Singapore declared independence in 1962 and their per capita income was $490 per person per year. And we can see that, you know, throughout the 60s and 70s, there was just gradual growth in national income. But by 1985 into 1995, just within that 10-year period, there was a dramatic increase from about $7,100 uh, per person per year, rising to... 25,000. So it more than doubled. Actually, it almost tripled. Um, and then we have the impact of the Asian financial crisis, 1997. So incomes fell. But then from 2002 to 2019, we just see sustained uh, increased per capita income, again, rising from 22,000 to almost 60,000. So again, tripling within a 20 year period. Now, how is that possible? Well, that was a result of many factors, but one of them was the decision by the central government of Singapore to really invest in their most important resource, which was their human capital. Singapore is a small country. You can walk across it within a day. They don't have many natural resources, so they wanted to take advantage of their most important resource, which is their, their labor force, their human capital. And that required um, investments in education and really investing to build a solid, effective, high quality education system. And as they were doing that, they knew that the uh, investment, the return on their investment in improving the quality of their labor would take time. Kids go into school and nursery, you know, 20 years later they come out and they eventually join the labor force. So it's a long run investment. So we can see that from 1962, as they began to build up their education system, there wasn't really too much of an increase in per capita income. But when we get to about a 20 year period, a 25 year period, then we start to see the effectiveness of them investing in education and improving the quality of their human labor. And from 1985 onward, just sustained uh, economic growth, sus sustained productivity, uh, rising standard of living, rising standard of income, uh, st standard of living and rising per capita income. One measure of the effectiveness of their education system is the PISA results, the Program for International Student Assessment. And I believe, yep, OECD countries participate and students are assessed across um, these member states and the results are published, I believe once every three years, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And we can see the rankings down here. Now take a look. In the 2018 um, PISA results, we see that number one in all three categories, mathematics, science, and reading is China. So China's really making those investments in their education system, making sure that it is a strong and quality education system that's public and accessible. And uh, as a result, they're gonna improve the quality of labor and they're gonna achieve increased uh, GDP growth. Number two here is Singapore. Singapore number two in mathematics, in science and in reading. So Singapore's investment, although it's a small nation, is definitely paying off as we can see in the GNI per capita income. Then we have Macau and Hong Kong, Taiwan. So we see East Asian nations really ranking quite high as a result of their solid public education system. And then we also have Nordic nations, Finland, um, Finland we see here, uh, perhaps Denmark, um, and also we see Estonia as a Baltic state. So these are countries that are really making that supply side interventionist investment. So how can we illustrate that? We can use two graphs, one to illustrate the short run and the long run impact of that investment. But first let's take a few notes, all right? Supply side interventionist, and it's called interventionist because the government is intervening, all right? There is a degree of government intervention
all right, in the pursuit of uh, spending on public education, public health, uh, infrastructure, etc. Okay, so there's several things that are that are considered supply side interventionists. Number one is investments in human capital. investing in your labor force. And that is done typically through government investments in public education. So we can improve the quality of our labor resource, going from low skilled work, a low skilled workforce to a high skilled workforce, and also investments on public health. A healthy population is a productive population. Another technique used in supply side interventionist is investments in technology. We know that technology has the impact of shifting SRS out and also shifting the longer area supply curve. Investments in technology um, can be the government providing um, incentives for firms to uh, invest in research and development um, to innovate, to develop new technologies. And for uh, the labor force that's working within these firms are getting that training. And perhaps some of those people can leave and start their own companies. So that's a spillover benefit to the rest of the society and the macro economy. Number three could be investments in infrastructure. And this is uh, very important for developing nations. Investments in infrastructure. And that includes uh, building public roads, uh, providing public lighting at night, providing uh, public transportation, uh, railroad lines to connect cities, towns, and villages, telecommunication lines, seaports, airports, etc. All of these physical capital goods that are built through investment spending on the part of the government allows for inputs and outputs to move efficiently within an economy. Uh, people can live in one village or town or city and travel to work in a neighboring town or city thanks to the roads that connect them, etc. And last, number four, industrial policies. Okay, again, the government providing the incentives that will allow uh, companies to thrive, to uh, grow over time, to perhaps even be protected if they're an infant industry. And as they achieve economies of scale, the government can uh, scale back and allow them to compete in a global market. But um, the policies that governments have to attract businesses, to allow entrepreneurs to develop their businesses, uh, to expand over time, et cetera. All right, so these are all part of supply side interventionists, but we're gonna focus on number one, investments in human capital through public education um, and public health, but we're gonna focus on public education. So let's go ahead and uh, illustrate this through our monetarist models. Okay, so we're gonna have graph A And graph A is going to be focused on the short run investments, while graph B will illustrate the long run um, return on investment. In graph A, we will have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. Actually, let me use a straighter line. We'll label that 81. We'll have an upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve. Again, let me use a straighter line. And the intersection of SRES1 with 81 provides an equilibrium price level at PL1. an equilibrium level of GDP at Y1. Okay, so here we are at Y1 with price level at PL1, and we'll call that point A. In the long run, 
uh, graph, we're just going to illustrate the long run aggregate supply curve. So we will illustrate that with our perfectly inelastic LRES curve, illustrating the potential GDP when resources are fully employed. So this is LRES1 and Y1. And you can also illustrate this with the Keynesian aggregate supply curve, but we're going to just use the Montrus model. So Singapore in 1962, um, over the course of two decades, perhaps from 1962 into the 70s until about 1985, they begin to invest heavily on education. Uh, they're trying to train their future teachers, uh, perhaps get consultants to come in and advise them on the best measures to provide the best teaching techniques, to provide the best teachers, etc. And they begin to build public schools and hire public teachers, et cetera. And that all requires government spending. So AD equals C plus I plus G. So the government spending is increasing and AD is shifting out as a result. From 81 to 82. That allows Singapore to achieve economic growth through that government spending in the short run. They are paying construction companies to build public schools. They are hiring teachers that will eventually take their, um, their salaries and spend as consumption spending. And over time, we see that the aggregate demand is increasing, leading to a rise in the price level or leading to demand pull inflation. Okay, so we go from point A to point B due to government spending on public education. That investment in human capital in the long run leads to higher quality uh, human capital. So whenever there is an improvement in the quality of our resources, like human capital, it causes the potential GDP to increase, in this case from LRES 1 to LRES 2. The education has turned low-skilled workers to high-skilled workers. They're more productive, more innovative, uh, more entrepreneurs starting new businesses, um, taking advantage of new opportunities, and the potential GDP rises. And that is reflected again in Singapore's ability to increase GNI per capita over time thanks to the initial investment in human capital. Now we can see that it took a couple of decades to get that return in investment. So it is definitely a long run investment, but in the short run, you can achieve economic growth. So let's go ahead and illustrate or analyze this as we would on a paper one exam. As can be seen, we have two graphs illustrating the concept of interventionist supply side policies, government intervention, in this case in the form of investments or government spending uh, to invest and improve the quality of human capital through public education and perhaps even public health. In our short run graph, we're measuring real GDP and uh, on the x-axis and the price level on the y-axis. In our long run graph, we are also measuring real GDP on the x-axis and the price level on the y-axis. In graph A, we have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve labeled 81, according to the wealth effect, the international trade effect, and the in interest rate effect. Now we have an upward sloping SRAS curve as a result of how a rise in the price level leads to increasing profits for firms, which incentivizes them to increase their quantity of output. Where SRS1 equals 81 at point A, it provides an equilibrium price level at PL1 and an equilibrium level of GDP output at Y1. With the uh, low quality uh, human capital that the country has at point A, the potential GDP is illustrated in graph, oh, let me put graph B, um, at LRES 1, perfectly inelastic, providing a potential GDP, perhaps I'll call this YP1 and YP2, at YP1. So the LRES curve illustrates that we are when we are fully employing our land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship, this is the most amount of output that we can get. Then the government decides to uh, increase spending in improving the quality of their education system and perhaps even the quality of their health system. So government spending increases, which leads to aggregate demand increasing from 81 to 82. The government is also engaging in investment spending by building physical capital, such as public schools, pu public hospitals, 
and government spending in the form of providing wages to public school teachers and doctors and nurses, et cetera. That investment and government spending leads to AD shifting out, which leads to increased aggregate demand and leads to demand pull inflation. Where 82 equals SRS1 at point B, we see a rise in the price level from PL1 to PL2 and an increase in real GDP from Y1 to Y2. As a result of that increase in aggregate demand, we can see that there's an increase in the quantity of aggregate supply, which means that firms are employing more resources like labor, so unemployment is falling. Um, in the short run, that's a short run investment. So in the long run, after perhaps a decade, a decade and a half, or two decades, human capital that has been um, benefiting from the investments in education has gone from low skilled to high skilled. And these high skilled students join the labor force and they become much more productive um, and much more innovative in the macro economy. So we see the LRAS curve increasing due to an improvement in human capital from LRAS1 to LRAS2, thus the potential GDP increases from YP1 to YP2. So remember that if there is an improvement in the quality, an improvement in the quality of our factors of production, like labor, the LRS curve will shift out. All right, an improvement in the quality will lead to uh, LRS shifting out. In addition, if we increase the quantity of our resources, this is just review, the quantity of factors of production or resources, we have more inputs, thus we can produce more outputs, LRS shifts out. And number three, technology, even though we didn't utilize that example, um, technology typically has the effect of shifting the LRS curve outward. Um, and this is, you know, just a review of concepts that we've talked about before. So that's it. Intervention supply side policies. Uh, and that's how we would graph and explain its impact. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.